presentations that we do over the lunch hour about once a, about once a week or a couple times a month. Um, we do them throughout the semester and they're just times for any student, staff, or faculty at Fort Hayes State University to come and share their passions with the rest of you. So thank you all so much for coming. And today we have the Department of Political Science presenting on uh, this year's elections, which have been incredibly exciting. So uh, I'll give the floor to them and thank you all so much for coming. And uh, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm, uh, I'm Chapman Rackway. I'm a professor in the uh, political science department in the acting chair this year. Uh, also, I'm as the advisor for the political management program. I, I'm pretty, uh, uh, pretty close paying attention to, uh, to this e election. And uh, we're seeing something that looks quite monumental, like something that we hadn't seen in generations in, uh, in this election. Uh, these primaries, especially on the GOP side, look as though we may be going to the first contested uh, convention on the Republican side uh, since the 1940s, the, the first multi-ballot convention. It is entirely possible that, uh, that that's going to happen. And so it, it gives me the opportunity to say that the rules matter because for the first time in a long, long time, people are paying attention to delegate counts and how rules committees at conventions work, what pledged versus unpledged delegates are, what they mean, and what kind of consequences they have. Because it is, we think that it is so easy to just cast a vote and magically that gets transformed with people's preferences and we get the, the fairest outcome possible. But the rules do matter in the way that you change the rules, change how the game is played. And so the, the rules are something that people are finally paying attention to, more so than they have in generations, and that matters. Because over time, we have created a primary system that is a bit of a Frankenstein's monster. It used to be that the parties selected who they, they wanted, they sent them on to the general election, and we, the voters, decided among those choices. In moving to primaries, we've corrupted that process, we've added in any number of rules that are highly anti-majoritarian and suppress voter turnout. When we talk about record voter turnout in these primaries, we're talking about, in some cases, only as high as 11% voter turnout, and that's record highs. So we've got issues, hopefully this is gonna shine a light on them and, and address them. Each one of us is only going to talk fairly briefly, just a couple of minutes, because we've got a great turnout here. There's probably a lot of questions that you have. There's probably a, a great opportunity for dialogue. So we'll keep it short. Therefore, I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to pass to my colleague, Dr. Joe Romance. Uh, good afternoon. I, my name is Joe Romance. I also the political science department, obviously. I talk about elections a lot in my intro class, but I also like to the big picture sometimes. And Professor Rackaway talked about the newness or the differentness of this election, how it's different from the past many, well, many election cycles. I want to talk about just a few minutes about how it's, in some ways, similar to all the previous primary elections, things like that. You actually just inspire me to think a little differently about my presentation. Yeah. Um, Call an audible. Yeah, exactly. Call it slightly audible. Um, in some ways, this election is new. In some ways, it's actually very, very um, traditional. I mean, we know the new stuff, and I'm sure you guys want to talk about it. Professor Rackway mentioned the contested convention. I suppose all of you want to talk about Trump. He's definitely a different kind of character. But I want to talk about something similar. You similarly. do, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to mention is in some ways this election cycle looks a lot like previous election cycles. And let me just briefly say this. I was talking this morning in my Intro American Government class about what a political party is. And um, I won't go into the whole 40 minute discussion, we only got a couple minutes here. But um, a political party in part is an organization that seeks power, okay? And they want to win elections. But a political party is also, and most students say this, is also a, a, a group of people that believe in certain ideas. Okay? And, the, and elections, with them, the election process, when not just between Democrats and Republicans, but among Democrats and among Republicans, is in a fight between wanting power for the party, but also a fight for ideas. And nowhere, you see this on both sides. I'm going to talk about the Democrats for a few minutes because I just want to use one example. And it's very clear on the Democratic side, it's a little less clear on the Republican side. Um, on the Democratic side, it's very clear what this is about, right? You have Bernie Sanders, who wasn't even a registered Democrat until last year, whose, whose most important thing is ideas. And he, has a, he really believes in changing things. He, he's, he's kind of a socialist, although not a far left socialist. He's, a, he's an American socialist, even though there's not many of them, but there's him. Um, and and uh, Hillary Clinton, who's still a liberal, but much more believing in the process, much more believing that her resume is why she should win, and she's going to lead to victory for the Democrats. You know, Bernie doesn't say he's not going to lead to victory. He 
people face and when he's going to bring new people to the system. But his appeal is often based on ideology. Right? I don't care what's right or wrong. And I don't care about winning or losing. I care about this is what we, we need, this is what's right. And parties are in part about what they think we should do, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans. But parties are also about we want power. Right? And there's always a tension there. I, I don't, I'll just shut up now. The Republicans are the same kind of thing, but the Democrats are a very clear one. Bernie, very hard left. Hillary, liberal, no doubt about it, but more moderate. And, and Hillary's appeal is I'm, the, I'm, I'm an experienced person who will lead us to victory. Bernie is I'm going to change the way the system works. Brian Bennett. My name is Brian Bennett. I teach in uh, law and the courts section of political science. So my focus is on how the legal system is impacted by the politics and it's all, it's all really politics, law, it's all mixed together. I would say that the nomination of the Supreme Court Justice is probably, if not the most important thing that this election hinges on, then it's certainly in the, the top couple. As many of you might know, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia uh, passed away um, somewhat unexpectedly, although he was kind of not in great shape if you look at his pictures. Um, but anyway, he passed away. Let's be honest, right? He liked his pasta. He, he loved his pasta um, and his wine. Uh, but he passed away, and when that happens, the Constitution says that the executive, the president, shall, uh, with the advice of the Senate, the Senate, they shall nominate someone to fill the vacancy on the court. Uh, so the president is required to put forth an appointment. Obama has selected Merrick Garland uh, as his appointee. Uh, Judge Garland has not had a uh, lot of success in meeting with uh, congressional Republicans in specific, although some have talked to him. Uh, but the Republican Party has taken the position that uh, they don't believe it would be appropriate to consider the nomination until after the election, until a new president is in office. Um, they, I think, I mean, it, it all just sort of depends upon the American people and uh, and how long they will tolerate um, that kind of a delay. And I think they, they certainly will be able to push it um, probably to the to past the election. I don't know if that will do them necessarily much good, uh, depending on how the election outcome <coughs> comes, because if a, if a Democrat is elected, then you may get a, an appointee. It may be Garland, or it may be somebody even more left. Uh, but obviously, the hope is that the Republicans can capture the White House and then change uh, who, the, uh, who the appointee, the nominee, would be. The reason that matters is because the United States Supreme Court is nine justices, and for a long time we've had, you know, some fairly close decisions on, on important issues, five-four type decisions, uh, and Scalia sat as one of the conservative, although not the most conservative, but one of the, the conservative voices on the court. So his absence means um, that you you've lost a sort of conservative voice, and then it would be replaced either by a liberal or, or a conservative uh, appointee, depending on who picks. Uh, right now. And the reason this, this situation can't just be held out for a long time, it can't just be delayed, is because right now um, you're having decisions that come out 4-4. Uh, and that's fairly rare. The court tries to avoid that if they can at all costs, because what that means is that you have a tie, and it means that the lower court decision holds, but only in the jurisdiction for that part of the country. And so you end up with decisions, and we're having this start to happen, where the law is truly different in the Ninth Circuit versus the Tenth Circuit. Right? It, 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 it's hard for businesses to plan, it's hard for individuals to know what's going on. And so um, that they'll want to get that rectified as soon as possible. Uh, I, like I said before, though, I think Congress has you know, the patience of the people at least to, to prolong this past the election, but I don't know in the end what good that will do. And it could end up you know, being a, something to, to hammer them with during the election cycle. So, but, so that's my thing. Jim, sir? Well, uh, I feel I should assume Parties. <laughs> because I, I, I'm not a U.S. citizen, and uh, uh, I did not grow up here. And you know, the, the I'm still learning of the U.S. election system. That doesn't mean you know less than U.S. citizens. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have the little knowledge among my colleagues regarding the election. And uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm teaching public administration mostly here uh, at, at the department. So uh, this, you know. This year's election is extremely uh, interesting to me. Is that uh, you know I notice how fractured uh, you know, the U.S. politics is. E even within the party, you see people have, you know, of course, this is during the primary, and and candidates want to d distinguish themselves from others. But you see, you know, extreme uh, 
proposals, ideas uh, in, within each party, especially uh, in, on the uh, Republican side. And uh, as a policy person, uh, you know, I tend to notice that, uh, you know, I tend to think how, how, how difficult it is, how practical it is uh, for all those ideas proposed by these candidates, political candidates, you know, when they really take office, will those policies be even passed in the legislature? You know, not to mention if, if it, you know, it can be implemented or not. So those are two things I noticed. And uh, uh, <coughs> I also have been looking at these poll numbers. Uh, I, I'm teaching research methods. I'm kind of a number person there. So uh, I really look forward to the dialogue between the audience and, and my colleagues regarding those, those uh, poll numbers. Very good. Josephine Squires. Okay, well, um, I am looking at it from, I teach international relations and comparative government, so I'm looking at it from a, an international perspective. And what I've been looking at is, is how other countries see U.S. elections. Well, of course, you might say because sovereignty is a fundamental pillar of international law, what does it matter what they think about U.S. elections? They can't alter them anyway, or can it? I don't know. Um, but in fact, it probably does matter what others think about um, our presidents and the people in our leadership. Uh, because there is such a phenomenon as, the, as Joseph Nye's soft power. And soft power, uh, quite the opposite of military power and hard power, the ability to get things done by force, is the ability to get things done by attraction. And so, um, for this reason alone, whoever we choose as a president um, may or may not make her or himself more attractive, and, and uh, by extension, the United States less or more attractive. And I have to, we said we wouldn't talk about this, and I'm not going to talk about it much. But the people in, I talked to a few people, only a few, anecdotally, and found their reaction. I've read several newspapers and several, from several countries. And unfortunately, although people do, the, the usual person in the street is not interested anyway. Some of them are not even interested in their own election. But um, the leadership, you might say, and particularly the diplomatic corps, are very interested in who gets voted as president. And unfortunately, um, instead of looking at it as is usually the case, as a, a broad scope of candidates who, who may or may not suit them, they are all riveted on Mr. Trump. Mm -hmm. And so, um, most of the reaction comes towards him. <coughs> And, you know, and it's not terribly favorable. In fact, Der Spiegel, a German newspaper, called him the most dangerous man in the world. And um, uh, several other commentaries, even David Cameron, who holds his political, basically, the same political ideology as a, as a Republican would, um, didn't think he was very um, desirable. <coughs> I think Angela Merkel of Germany, uh, people in Holland, France. Um, the diplomatic war <coughs> apparently has now gone from being rather amused and titillated by everything that went on to fearful and even panicked. So this is one of the, uh, I can't avoid saying it, because no matter what you read, no matter where you are, this is what is riveting them. Should it be the case? I don't know. But um, it, it is. Okay. Larry Gould, sure. Um, I'll broaden the perspective here just, just a little bit um, and all of these issues that my colleagues have been talking about kind of kind of cross um, some of the things I want to talk about in a variety of different ways. And I want to <coughs> on. My starting point is really the American Democracy Project. I mean, this election is just absolutely super. When we brought it here 2003, 2004, um, you know, the, the purpose of the American Democracy Project is to enhance the ability of state comprehensive universities like 48 State to educate our, our undergraduates. I mean, that's an essential purpose to begin with. 
but the project was designed to enhance that in a whole variety of ways, and we're having a reflection of that here in terms of <coughs> talk today. But, you know, a starting point for a lot of this is civic literacy. I mean, the, the idea that our undergraduates would take away some enhanced ability to understand what was happening um, with regard to American politics and certainly what's going on with regard to American democracy. Um, as I said a moment ago, uh, many of the issues that my colleagues have been discussing just cross this whole idea of what civic literacy is all about in, in so many <coughs> different ways. Um, starting out with the party thing. I mean, we all know that the founding fathers didn't want to have anything to do with parties, and yet here we are wrestling in 2016 um, with parties, maybe the elimination of one party, maybe you know a, a new party, or some, whatever Trump does, maybe a third party at work again. Who knows, but the, the whole concept of party was something that the founding fathers weren't too excited about. If we talk about, um, you know, Trump himself, I mean, he's obviously the Founding Fathers' worst nightmare um, in, in terms of demagoguery, um, in terms of the kind of, and demagoguery <coughs> were appealing to people's emotions as opposed to, to logic and a lot of other kinds of things. And that wasn't really what the Founding Fathers were, were looking for. Um, and in addition, the demagoguery leads into another concept that's very important in terms of the American system of government, and, and that's the whole idea of, of a, an elitist form of democracy as opposed to direct democracy, which we're seeing every day. Um, and Trump's ranting and railing probably as I speak about you know, the rig system and basically people in Colorado that didn't get a chance to vote, um, despite the fact, as I discussed in class this morning, the Coloradans probably didn't want to vote because it was a waste of time with regard to the amount of money you have to spend for a primary. Uh, we got rid of our primary in Kansas a long time ago, um, to a great degree on the result of, of cost, um, more than anything else. It wasn't that somebody wanted to rig, rig the election or, or anything else or the election since then. But this whole idea of having a more elitist form of democracy, a representative form of democracy, is a part of that civic literacy in, in this electoral process, is really putting that um, front and center um, with regard to people that don't understand it, and I'm sure there are millions of them, um, relative to what we're trying to do with undergraduates here at Fort Hayes and, and across the American system of, of higher education. Um, <coughs> That, that direct form of democracy um, was, again, something that the Founding Fathers feared to a great extent. Um, they changed things a little bit when they decided to redo the Senate, so to speak, and how you voted for the Senate in a more direct form as opposed to something that looked like the Electoral College at first. But that's all part of the civic literacy thing that I've been getting at here in terms of trying to use this election to, to understand it uh, a great deal better. Um, I'll, I'll shut up here in a moment and simply say this, in terms of one success that I see in the electoral process so far is this, and that is the ability to use the term liberal again. Um, and you can probably, I guess, give credit to Bernie Sanders in terms of um, his, his movement, um, his efforts. Um, to basically bring the term through <laughs> a whole variety of different pathways and, and channels um, back into, into play. I'm not sure there was a great deal of intent there, but progressive hasn't worked as well, moderate hasn't worked as well. Um, but even at this point in time, in, in April, um, three, four months before the, the final electoral, final election, um, part of the electoral process, um, we see more and more of the media using the term liberal, um, which again goes to ideology and, and media and a whole variety of other elements that are part of the electoral process. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of issues that are raised for our understanding of civic literacy and what it means to be civic literate, but the election is, is bringing many of those elements out in a way that um, have not occurred in, in previous elections um, to the extent that it that's occurring today. So pl plenty of room for discussion, plenty of room for quizzing and, and asking people about, about what's going on with regard to you know, ideology and, and again, um, the media. And the media is getting a whole lesson in and of itself um, in terms of Trump's approach to the media, which many of us know is another part of American democracy in terms of the fourth state. 
um, for the state, which basically the founding fathers suggested back in the print media days, um, was something necessary to keep government in line, to limit government, to keep politicians in line, and to do a whole variety of, of things. Technology has changed much of that and expanded its use, but it's still something that needs to be considered. <laughs> understand specifically what you're first. So I'll stop there. <coughs> if you have some questions and you can roam far and wide and give them a philosophical discussion. I hope I'm presenting. And so uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, would uh, love to uh, to see you uh, bring yours to us. So uh, please just uh, bring your questions forward and say whether you have uh, questions for the entire panel or for particular ones of us. The floor is open to you now. Okay. So I'm not very political, like my parents never discussed it in the parties and such with me. But my mom and I have been discussing here recently, there was that big basketball game where it was going to fall on a voting day and they moved the poll so they can vote there. But then in Rooks County, they have to come here to Hayes to do their voting. There, yeah. Uh, you're talking about the, the Kansas uh, uh, caucuses. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there was a particular game of the NCAA Division One basketball tournament it was held in St. Louis. Okay. Now, forgive me, I grew up in SEC <coughs> country. Football is kind of my thing. I don't know if it was Wichita State or KU. Don't I'm not throw sure. things. It was a good game. But it, I think it was KU because I believe that what they did was the, the Douglas County parties ran satellites. And because <coughs> primaries, or when they're, when they're caucuses, they tend not to be regulated by the state. They're regulated by the, the parties. So literally, if they wanted to hold a satellite caucus in Albuquerque, New Mexico, St. Louis, or Timbuktu, they're within their, their ability to do so. Okay. And that was why they chose to do that. Was it, There was going to be a big chunk of people that weren't going to be there. So the, the caucus, and, and there's a lot of things to hate about a caucus. But they, they can follow the voters off site, and that's a good thing. Okay. It's one of the only good things you'll hear me say about caucuses. Okay, yeah, because she was pretty upset because she you know, didn't yeah. want to drive the hour to come to, to put in her vote for the caucus. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that the caucus for Democrats in Western Kansas, uh, the closest one, like from the state line all the way over, was Hayes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you had to move. I mean, there were people in Hayes from near, near Colorado. And that's one of the terrible lies about caucuses that they keep spreading. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go against what Larry was saying about cost savings, but there is no such thing as a free lunch. Someone pays eventually. It saves the state one to one and a half million dollars to not run a primary. But to run a caucus, it foists the cost of that onto the local party committees. And so if you went to the local Republican caucus, which did include not only Ellis County, but also Rooks County. They were taking collections up to help pay the roughly $2,500 that it took that county party, those two county parties, to run that. So all you've done is you've shifted the cost onto the local level, and if there's anything we know about the political parties, they're exceedingly low, uh, <coughs> uh, low operating. So they didn't have the money to do that, which meant that the local party chair made up anything they couldn't get um, uh, donations for. So it really just forces costs on the other people. <coughs> like I said, the movement is the only nice thing I have to say about caucus. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, I think that you were talking about the 4-4 the decisions, and I haven't, I mean, I guess I haven't been taking up the but can you, you give, like, speech to opinion on this Yeah, there's, there's a couple issues. The biggest one, I think, recently, um, and again, they try to avoid a 4-4 decision if, if, if at all possible, and the justices will do that not only through trying to persuade each other in the, in the written briefs, but also in, in just in chambers meetings and then an argument. They also vote strategically. So, uh, you need a certain quorum of the Supreme Court in order to, to hear a case in the first place, and sometimes you might vote to not hear a case that you would like to hear because you think the outcome might come out the wrong way. So there's a lot that goes into that, really, um, and a lot of things that they can do kind of behind the scenes to avoid a confrontation where it's going to have a split decision. Uh, a former member of the court 
said uh, that it is better to have a bad decision, a bad rule, than to have no rule at all because of the rule of law principle. And so they really want to avoid a situation where you end up with a tie because what that does is it, it defaults the decision back down to whatever the lower court had held. From the, the cases that were in front of the court, coming up in front of the court, when Scalia passed away, most of those decisions fall liberal. Most of them fall to the, to the lower court decision, which is a what you would characterize as kind of a liberal type decision. Uh, so, so generally, that's that's kind of where we are. The most, the biggest example, like, like we're saying, of that is probably the California Teachers Union case, uh, which was a 4-4 decision, um, and it was a challenge to requiring uh, non-union members to pay dues into the for representation uh, into the into the union. So it was the California law basically tried to get rid of free riders by forcing everybody to, to pay something in and because you're, you're getting the representation whether you're a union member or not, you get the benefits of it. So there was a challenge to that based on um, First Amendment grounds and some other things uh, and that ended up uh, tied and going, um, going back down to the, to the lower court decision. The effect of that is that the Ninth Circuit then has different laws than what you might have in you know, the Fifth Circuit like Georgia or the Tenth Circuit in Kansas or something like that. Um, and so that makes it difficult for uh, businesses, for, for anybody who's dealing with union type employees to know what, you know, which way is the, is, which way is the wind blowing, how are we going to predict how we're going to do these contracts and negotiations and things in the future. Uh, so that's probably, probably the biggest example right now, but there's, there's several cases um, where, uh, you know, the court, the court can, uh, you know, put a stay on the case, they can refuse to issue a decision, uh, they, they might do that, but they want to avoid those ties, but until we get an actual, a, a Confirmed, uh, confirmed justice, they're, they're just, it's going to be in limbo. Uh, and, that, and because of that, um, that's why I say there's only a certain amount of time that I want to say the American public will tolerate this, but let's be honest, the American public sometimes doesn't pay as much attention or really follow what's going on. What's going to happen is the Bar Association won't allow it. Um, and so the American Bar Association will uh, start causing a huge stink in Congress um, if, if things like if, if it doesn't get resolved. So let's play Back to the Future. It's back to 2000 and it's Florida. Okay, yeah. And the Supreme sure. Court's involved. Yep. And we have 4 4. What happens? <laughs> it's called a constitutional crisis. Florida doesn't report its electoral votes. Nobody hits the 271 threshold, and the House of Representatives decides. Okay. That was an educational point, though. It's setting up for And of course, um, Hillary Clinton doesn't probably have, or Bernie Sanders doesn't have a great time in the House of Representatives in terms of its, its current um, constituency. Uh, Neither does Donald Trump nor Ted Cruz. And probably Donald Trump. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really kind of interesting, um, that possibility. We're talking about potential convention, open conventions, and whatever kind of conventions, brokered conventions. But at the same time, in terms of American democracy, there's a whole variety of things here that, that are still not being discussed in any great detail, but they're there um, as a result of the, the system. And let me piggyback on his 2000 comment as well, because that illustrates another point about the Supreme Court. Uh, during the 2000 election, they ultimately decided that, well, you have to have standards in place, you know, you don't have them in place, basically we're going to shut off, you've had time to try to comply, and, and you're out of time, is what they said. Um, that, that decision was seen, at least by the media, as handing the presidency to, um, to Bush. But public opinion polls of the Supreme Court didn't even, didn't even blink. So the Supreme Court routinely has the highest approval rating of any of the branches of government. Maybe we're, just, we're protective of old people or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and even when they make controversial decisions, you'll hear a lot about it in the media, but it doesn't affect their overall approval rating. Uh, and I mean, the lesson from, uh, from Roosevelt and the court packing plan and then, and then other threats to change the numbers on the courts and things, um, I think is that the public doesn't react well when the, the politicians uh, seem to be playing with the court. I mean, the, the American public tolerates a certain amount of it, but after a while, um, it becomes problematic. Um, so you know, I, I think that's, again, another reason why uh, there'll be a push, certainly, after the election for the, for the nomination. Uh, I'm going to sort of tie together a rule clear to the Chef Rackway point, and this specific point. Um, as Professor Rackway pointed out, just now and in your own your own initial presentation, we have rules in place, right? Uh, I, I said it would be a constitutional crisis if we had a, a Florida redux, but as you pointed out immediately, well, there's the House of Representatives, there's, there's, there's procedures, the, the Constitution does provide for it. 
But what I want to point out, or ask you guys actually, would it seem fair to you? Right? There's on one level, there are rules and procedures that are in place that don't cost you. There are also rules and procedures in place that Donald Trump is complaining about, which I believe the RNC chair at list last week said, those are the rules, they've been that way for a long time. Okay? He, of course, sees as unfair. What I'm trying to get to is the optics of this, the, the appearance of it. On one level, both our parties and our system have rules in place, and no one's really changing them, right? We've had these delegate rules for a long time that you, you alluded to, but they haven't been really relevant. And what I'm trying to say is, what do you guys think? If Trump gets more votes than anyone else, gets more primary votes than anyone else, wins more primaries, but he's denied the nomination of the Republican Party, on one level, the Republican Party will say, well, that's just the way the rules are, you, you lost. On the other hand, people might say, but that's not fair. Uh, or maybe, you, maybe you guys wouldn't say that. I don't know what you guys would say. Right. That's certainly what Sanders is saying with the superdelegates yeah. on the Democratic right. side. Mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah, good example. The Democrats have something called superdelegates. They don't, they're not selected via the primary process. They sit automatically with, um, in, the, in the convention. But that's, those are the rules of the Democratic Party. There's nothing secret about them. They've been well known for more than 20 years. To kind of extend Joe's point out even further, though, <laughs> you know, here's a bunch of elites talking about the rules of the game, but Joe Sixpack out there is having a hell of a time um, understanding the rules of the game because he or she, who hasn't got a, a wage increase in 30 years, um, who believes that international trade agreements um, end up with, you know, moving jobs to, to China and, and elsewhere, um, and who thinks some, um, I can go on here, but I, I won't go on further, in, in a sense of saying that the masses have great difficulty in understanding the rules at this point in time, which leads back to what you were saying, Joe, about constitutional crisis and other kinds of things. Surrounding the rules are politics. I mean, politics are basically about serving interests. And they want their interests served. And Donald Trump has been the voice for serving their interests, yet it looks like, from their perspective to a great extent, um, the, the system is, is really not serving their interests anymore, and they believe that direct democracy was the way in which they were going to attack the establishment um, or be anti-establishment. And I get a kick out of a lot of this, you know, that because I've come through the 1960s and I watched 18-year-olders and people like myself back then railing and ranting against the Vietnam War and against basically the hierarchy of higher education and what it's doing to us in terms of coursework and no shared governance and representation on campus and all the good stuff. And then Chicago in 1968. Now I see a lot of 50-year-old white guys um, basically doing what the, us kids did um, kids back then uh, doing today, and, and that is thinking we have the right to revolution and, and, and going to change things because it just not, the system's not not working for us. I think also in the mix of all of this is just a, a lot of demographics and a lot of other things going on. I mean, certainly it's it's white guys. Um, and I'm ex exaggerating to make a point here. It's a bunch of old white guys who are following Trump down the road, yeah. along with a few others. Um, there's a lot of young folks who think that uh, Bernie Sanders is going to provide them with a, a free education and there's a free lunch and all of this and we're going to take care of student debt. Um, there's a bunch of old white guys who think that Hispanic folks and black folks are taking over and we're going to stop this thing right now um, in terms of selection and Donald Trump's basically um, our, our voice piece for that. Um, I could go on here provoking a whole variety of different constituencies in terms of what the election is about, but it is about, to a great degree, race with regard to having a black president for the last seven, seven years. It is, to a great degree, about um, women and, and the way in which women have been treated um, in a variety of different ways over the past mm, long, long time um, in, in our society. It's about changing demographics, as I said, because Hispanics are supposed to be a majority by the year 2050. Um, and the Republican Party certainly hasn't um, listened to itself in terms of even what it said in 2012 about a new, new way of approach, the big umbrella, so to speak, the big tent, we're going to bring them all in. Um, Trump <coughs> is certainly the opposite direction with regard to that, although he thinks, and I think um, naively to a great extent, he's brought them into the tent. Um, and, and a whole variety of other things that are in, in play here. So if, if you just think the election's about the election, you're making a big mistake, and I, I'm suggesting to you, you know, get involved and pay attention. You know, and there's just a lot of things going on out there. Um, and you touched on, on a whole variety of them. I'd like to, what do you guys think about that? Is he just entertainment, or is he more than that? Or I'm voting for him. There you go. And why? Um, 
problem for one because I've watched illegal immigrants take my job for too many years and I'm tired of it. Yeah, you're one of those old white guys I'm talking about. Pretty, Pretty much. much. <laughs> 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 okay, but you're, I mean, you're, you basically see him as a voice for the kinds of things you've been trying to say for a while. Yeah, know. basically. Okay. Well, a lot of what he says, or what people say he says isn't the same thing as what he says. Yeah. You know, there there's a lot of what I've seen on the computer that is just horseshit. You know, you're not alone. Obviously, millions of people are, are, are doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah, you're just in here. <laughs> <laughs> the rest are all Bernie Sanders folks. Uh, probably quite a few. So, do you do you think that you, you considering that there there seems to be a little bit of a gap? You know, Trump seems to be taking his reality host job very serious, and you know, I've always thought that he's exaggerating for effect. It seems to be paying off for. But do you think that the kind of person that we see? Was Donald Trump on the campaign trail would be different were he to be elected president? And, and I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. I'm just asking because I don't know. Politicians. <laughs> well, but the, isn't that tr part of Trump's appeal though? Is, is that people think that he's a straight shooter? Hey, I'm, I'm not going to yeah, be. They, they think he can't be bought just because he's got so much yeah. money. I would. But, I, well, it, 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 at people the same who, time, people who do the buying rarely get bought. So <coughs> there, there's there's some validity to that statement. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we'll see if he gets elected. I mean, I hope he does what he says he'll do, but let's face it, they usually don't. I would say that what Trump is channeling is this, what's fueling a lot of the Bernie Sanders idea as well, and that is a dissatisfaction with the system and yeah. looking for a candidate mm -hmm. that's just going to yeah. say, look, this is this yeah. is controlled by an elitist group, uh, you know, a social class kind of group, and we're just tired of getting the short end of it. I do yeah. find it kind of funny that the answer to that is a guy whose first car was a limousine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but it's an outsider perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it's interesting to me, it's on the left and the right. So it's interesting to me, touching what Professor Bass said, was, and in one, on one, on one, from one angle, Trump and Bernie are totally different. On another angle, they're very similar. They're both speaking to this, this outrage and anger. But from the third angle, um, they actually are, are um, very different again. Um, Trump, what, when Trump is asked, what is he going to do? Wait, besides the wall, he often talks about, um, I'm going to get the best people. And what is, what, what is it often his appeal? I'm a winner. And we want to elect a winner. We want to elect a guy who's good negotiate. What's the appeal here to the, a great person? Bernie Sanders' appeal, though, is to process the change in the rules of the game. He doesn't talk about getting the best people in government. He wants to change the way campaign he, he wants to change all the rules. Um, uh, Trump wants to change the people. It's like, it's like, you go back to the 19th century in the story, it's like the great man theory of history is Trump. And Bernie Sanders is more of the process theory, right? We're going to change the process. Um, so on, 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 there's, there's like, almost like three different angles you can look at. They're completely different on one level. They're very similar to another because they're channeling anger and what the establishment's done. But how do, you, how do we solve the establishment problem? problem? Do we bring in a great person or do we change the rules about how we get things done? I think you just brought up another concept that's very important in all of this. There, there's the anger, the fear, the outrage, and all this other good stuff. But the word establishment has been thrown around in a way that I haven't heard for literally 30, 40 years. Um, I had to go on the bookshelf and pull out a, a volume that was basically, it's an edited book, um, put out by the Center for Democratic Institutions out of Santa Barbara, California, which I don't think even exists anymore. But the title of it is The, the Establishment and All That. And in there are a series of essays that basically are very reflective of 2016 the way they were reflective of 1967, 1966, which a lot of folks are just saying, I'm tired of the establishment, you know, whatever the establishment, however you may define it. Um, but it does create a lot of this anger, fear, and all the rest, and so we're going to attack it um, in, in a variety of different ways. And I think both Ber Bernie and, and Donald bring that together um, up in this term, but the, but the term is just not that well defined. But it's used. Go ahead. No, no, I was oh, watching agreeing with you. No, I mean it, it's just used in a way that a lot of people feel it encapsulates a lot of their concerns and, and, and interests. And we're going to take out against the establishment, including the Republican National Committee, um, and, and elements of the. The one thing everybody can agree on is they're not happy with the way things are. Yeah, it's, and, it's good. and there's a great irony in that. 
because these primaries have forced parties to lay their dirty laundry out on the table. You can't handle them internally at a convention anymore. You got to hash them out during a primary. And primaries were a reaction against powerful political parties during the machine era, driven by folks who said, hey, more direct democracy, that's what we need to do. We need to inject more direct democracy into this. And now that we're seeing, seeing the failures of more direct democracy, a lot of these populists say the answer is clearly more direct democracy. Well, the old Einstein quote about the definition of insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and looking for different results, we're there. We're there. I have a question, uh, kind of changing a little bit here. But why are the two parties different from the standpoint of super delegates and not super delegates? You want to handle it? It's probably one of us. But use the other person. Okay, I'll, I'll correct you. <laughs> and he, he, he will and he should, because I'm just making this up. 1968, Democratic Convention in Chicago. We have primaries, but they're advisory. In the end, the delegates get to choose whoever they want. The delegates choose uh, Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. Primary winner, George McGovern of South Dakota. People erupt over that. They say, hey, the, you're thwarting the will of the people, the Bernie Sanders argument. And so um, they, uh, they reform their processes. Now, um, <coughs> basically, the rules were so written that you had to do a primary or a caucus. George McGovern wins in 72, and then uh, Jimmy Carter wins in 76. And the establishment look at that and say, well, we can't have this anymore. We have to have some bulwark against that. So after Carter fails in 1980, Democrats rewrite their rules for their 84 convention to include the superdelegates to give unpledged Democratic insiders, elected officials, party leaders, more of a voice <coughs> in the process. So they did it specifically to correct the same kind of problem they had in the 70s that Republicans are seeing now, and it's why I am willing to, to say that um, it, by 2020, Republicans will have their own iteration of the superdelegate. They'll have something like that because they don't want this kind of problem to happen again. Okay, correct me. No, no, okay. I, I think you did the history better than I did. What I have something to say is also that this really, I always take the, the 30,000 foot uh, view of things, and Chap knows <coughs> detail specifics. I can't uh, get off my microscope. Yeah. Uh, what I was, I was going to say is, as I said, parties seek power, but they also seek um, further ideological views. Sometimes parties pick candidates who ideologically are pure. And like, the Democrats did that in 1972 with George McGovern, and he got crushed, utterly crushed. All right. Um, the Republicans did it in 64 with Goldwater. And, but, yeah. Yeah, and so the party establishment, going back to Larry's term, establishment, they, they, they want to appeal to people's votes and everything, but they also want to produce winners. The idea with the Super Dogs on the Democratic side is that um, they want to make sure that the, the, the party, the, the, now that we let people choose to a significant degree, we want to make sure there's like a check on that. Not, because often, the, and this gets very, this gets a lot of interesting points here. We allow the people to choose, yeah, as Professor Wacker pointed out earlier in this presentation, very few people actually show up for these caucus of the primary, so how democratic is it really? But the point is, the idea was trying to balance the interests of the party as trying to win, right? We're not going to have a George McGovern again versus the desire to, um, to also reflect the will of the voters of the party and everything like that. And it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. Both parties tinker with the rules every four years, a little bit. Sometimes there are big changes, like the adopting of primaries after 68, and then the adopting of super delegates on the Democratic side. Now, your specific question. It's just a matter of sort of historical. The, the Democrats came to this concern, but they kept losing the presidency. And so they developed super delegates, thinking maybe that would help them win. And, um, uh, the Republicans, and then it's Professor Racco pointed out, it's good, there's a good chance Republicans on the side, we better have some sort of super delegates on our side too. They actually have a few, but they're not very significant, and they're slightly differently defined. Uh, they're a big chunk of the Democratic Convention. Right. Uh, so that, I hope that answers part of your yeah, question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because it just seems like we're, why they, why they are not the same 
you know, it just seems like there, there should be some standardization. I, I would go into another part of it too as well. I mean, the, the question's answered very well in response to your question, but I would also add, you know, these are private entities. Yes. They're not public entities. They can kind of do what they want to yeah. do to a great extent. And they can reflect their own cultures, which, which is why we don't want standardization. Right, and, and, and then, then you add to it, they get a chance to, <laughs> to have 50 different units and a couple in the territories as well, I mean, in terms of the Republican National Committee trying to remain in control. But a lot of the, the decision makings at the state level um, and because that decision making is at the state level, you've got all you've got a, a quilt of, of, of 50 different rules, so to speak, um, at, at the state level too for, for both parties. So I mean, it's it just one of the reasons why the founding fathers didn't really want to have parties around. I didn't, they didn't envision obviously what we have today entirely. But certainly, when you throw this element in, um, it gets away from the ability of the, the elites and. and You know, I think actually that question comes back directly to what you said just chap just before, when you said direct democracy. And we're going to go back the other way. Whatever you whatever you define the establishment to be, when movements like direct dem democracy and primaries are going to the establishment, the power holders are always going to seek a way to embrace that and make it their own, so that they maintain that power. And if that's the case, then Republican, the RNC is going to to do whatever they can to uh, either make super delegates and make sure that someone like Trump, if they really don't want him, because it's really interesting that they all say, no, 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 there's a war against Trump, and yet, but we'll back our, whoever our opinion is. <laughs> That's we'll see, almost as bad as McGovern. We'll, we'll see <coughs> if that actually plays out after the, the, um, the convention, convention itself, but it, it gets back to, to what Joe was, was saying. Yeah. Uh, about the, the different motivations of the parties. Parties are there to win. You know, the, the parties in this country are elite entities built to aggregate citizen preferences out of the great morass that, uh, that we thought we would, we would have here. And so it, it's kind of perverse of us to tell these political parties <coughs> that you have to submit the, the possibility of your own electability to a public that in many cases is antithetical to your causes. I keep the data on this because they're, one of my pet peeves is that a, a political primary for a party should be limited only to the people who belong to that party. If you're a Democrat, you shouldn't have Republicans in there because what are they gonna do? They're gonna sabotage your vote. And yet, with Donald Trump, the states where he does the best are in states that have what are called open primaries, when you can pick who you want, what party you want at the ballot box on the day of the election. You need not pledge loyalty to a political party to be able to cast that ballot. And so what you've got are a lot of independents and a lot of Democrats crossing over, putting Trump on that ballot. And why should the Republicans trying to win an election have that kind of candidate foisted upon them? That's another reason why primaries are so more dangerous. He, yes, he does. But we've seen it's that just not nearly as significant as it is. Yeah, there aren't as many Republicans crossing over for Bernie as there are no. Democrats crossing over for Bernie. Got a question, right? Question, question yeah, for come. the whole panel opinion from anyone. Do you guys think that a third party has a chance to gain any votes or power in the current fractured political landscape? Well, they certainly have a chance to get votes. Will they get power? <coughs> There's no way. Um, but, that, but that's still significant. If Trump is denied the nomination, which is still a distinct possibility, very much unknown here, I, I, in my opinion. Um, I, I, went, I, remember, I went from believing Trump was an entertaining person, being an interesting person, to being the, the likely nominee, and now after some recent losses, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with the rules being imposed. I mean, if he, let me put it this way, if he gets denied, the, if he doesn't get enough of delegates on the first ballot, I don't think it's the nomination. I think it's all or, all or nothing. He's gotta win. He's gotta win on the first ballot. Okay, but that still doesn't mean the third, he might run. He will definitely then take votes, but that's what's interesting. Where did he take them from? Mm -hmm. right? And if he decides to run on a third party or just an independent candidate, he has the money to probably get. Although I don't know what state deadline to get on the ballot. So. Well, I, it's not even that. There are nine states that have what are called sore loser laws. Right. If you contested a political party's primary, you are legally barred from seeking office as an independent. Therefore, including Trump's home state of New York, yeah. <laughs> so he couldn't be on the ballot in his own home state right. if he so, uh, sought. Out an independent nomination, and I think the succinct answer to yours, because the 
the in-depth answer takes three days, <laughs> is the, the electoral rules are rigged against anything that isn't a Democrat or Republican, and that's what prevents them. Not 2016, not our unique circumstances, but ballot access laws, petition uh, needs, sore loser laws, and so on, are the reason that a third party won't. They, they can play a spoiler, but they can do no, no more than that right now. Let me ask the Trump supporter. Uh, <coughs> you had a question? No. Oh, okay. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you about how you feel about Donald with regard to, to international politics. I teach international politics as well, along with, with Josephine. I, don't know. I mean, he doesn't have any real experience at it, but at the same time. You, you're I not don't upset trust when the competition you, either. Yeah, you're not upset when he talks about giving nuclear weapons to Japan. You what? You're not upset when he talks about giving nuclear weapons to Japan. Uh, half the world has got them. I mean, I, I think Japan should have to take care of themselves if they're gonna. If, if we're gonna provide their military for them, I think that we should have. We should get payment for it. Basically, same way with Korea. You know, South Korea, if we're going to take care of them, they need to pay for it. You know, we can't afford to keep growing things the way we have been. Despite the fact that we were the ones after the Second World War that said to Japan, you're not going to get nuclear weapons. Well, they did they fought pretty hard. You get punched in the nose when that happens. <laughs> can, okay. can I follow up with you on something else? Because you said something that, that triggered a, a theory in my mind. You were talking about Trump. And you said, but the rest of the competition, eh. are you really that enthusiastic about Trump, or is it that the rest of the field, the politics as usual folks, exactly. disgust you, and so Trump presents better kind of by proxy? Is, uh, is that a fair evaluation? Because I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm asking. Put on the best representation of the American legal system I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes down to the decision between the douche and the turd sandwich. <laughs> Good South Park quote. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it's an entire episode. It, mm -hmm. It's educational on the American election, electoral system. So it, it's not necessarily that, that you're ready to go out there and you will kick the doors down and, and beat the hustings for Trump. Yeah, but it, it's, it's finally like, okay, finally people. there's someone who's not these other folks that have, that have disaffected you for, for so long? Are, 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 are we in the ballpark there? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's he really aligns weird. himself more in the direction that I feel the country needs to go. Okay. You know, with uh, politically correctness and whatnot. Do we apologize for the psychoanalysis? We usually don't. Do. <laughs> no, not so bad. <laughs> but it's interesting to hear. I've got like another 20 minutes to catch up. Since you're the guy here, so to speak. I think there was a line the other night on one of the late night shows that says, like, I don't have a plan, but I hate yours. <laughs> you know, and, and that's how I kind of see Trump. Sounds like Saturday Night Live. I, I'm not sure what it was, but I mean, it was very distinct. You know, it's like, the definition of, boy, I hate all that establishment. I don't have a plan myself, but I hate yours. Uh, I at least agree with the plan he's got. But what is that plan from a standpoint you know, of the rule of law? Saying, well, if you want to talk about law, that cuts Hillary right out. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about Trump, though, the rule of law. I mean, as far as I can force this, I can force that, I can do these things. I mean. A, a serious naivete, or simply, uh, I'm pulling the wool over your eyes. That's one of the things that I have a problem with in this country nowadays. You can be a lawyer and still not understand the law. You can have ten lawyers in the same room; they'll all have a different opinion of what the law is. Well, you know, yeah, you but I'm right. Make things <laughs> 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 understand it. We are we're we're just at 1:30, and so uh, do we have any other uh, questions? Let's take one last one. If there's one from the crowd, well, that's the case. I, I particularly want to thank you for not asking the the question that the reporters always ask us, which is, "So, who's going to win?" Yeah. <laughs>
But thank you all very much for, uh, for coming to this time talk on behalf of the entire Department of Political Science. It's been our pleasure. Hope that you've gotten a lot out of it. We'll see you at the next time talk.